this is palak from memo pandits today we have a session on the topic how to build a career in law outside india um uh, for today's session we have our speaker mr rohan bilimoria mr rohan is a legal professional with a, a market leading magic circle firm us firm and fortune 500 in house experience in london Moscow, Delhi, Singapore, Sydney, and Tokyo. He is a senior legal counsel for a big four bank in Australia. A former in-house legal counsel for KFC Asia and Pizza Hut Asia Pacific, and a former attorney at law firms such as Linklater's and Mayer Brown. He is the founder of Law Ninjas, a global platform to help lawyers and law students, and has conducted interactive workshops for law students at institutions in Accra, Banaras, Bangalore, Bhopal, Cardiff, Colombo, Katak, Gandhinagar, Guwahati, Hawaii, Hong Kong, Hyderabad, Jodhpur. Kabul, Kano, Karachi, Kochi, Kolkata, and the list goes on. He is an international attorney, building a platform to help lawyers and law students across the globe with Magic Circle Firm, US Firm, and Fortune 500 in-house experience in London, Moscow, Delhi, Singapore, Sydney, and Tokyo. Uh, we welcome you, sir, for today's session. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. And hi everyone, my name is Rohan, and I'm calling you all from Sydney, Australia. So it's a bit late for me on a thir Thursday, right? Right today, uh, but I hope uh, that the next hour or so is going to be very, very interactive and very useful for all of you. Um, so the focus of today's session is not me and uh, you know my career. It's all of you, and I want to hear what challenges you're facing. What questions you may have or what things you're thinking about when it comes to the law, whether it comes to the future, whether it comes to further studies and so on. So uh, thank you to Memo Pandits for giving me this opportunity and for setting up this session. And in the chat on the right, please do put any questions that you may have uh, and I'll try and address them as we go or definitely when we do have time at the end. But let me just give you just to start things off, let me give you a couple of minutes of my background, uh, just so you kind of know what I've done and what sort of questions I'll be able to answer. Uh, because if you ask me about tax laws in Gujarat, I can assure you that I don't know that. But uh, let me kind of give you a little bit of uh, flavor. So I, I was born in Delhi, and then uh, I went to a high school called St. Columbus School, uh, which is also the school that Shah Rukh Khan went to. So that's my only claim to fame in life. Uh, and then when I was 14, my family um, and I Sorry to, to interrupt you, sir, but sure. somebody just personally texted me that they are not able to hear anything. So I would just request all the participants here to just confirm on chat once whether they're able to hear sir or me or not able to hear anyone at all. Okay, sounds okay. like I'm... Um, sounds like there's an good. error on the person's part, so... <laughs> Yeah, no please problem. continue, sir. Please continue. No problem. Um, okay. All right. Well, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so firstly, guys, the first rule of Law Ninjas, which I'll tell you a little bit about, is that don't call me sir. It makes me feel old. Call me Rohan. That's totally fine. Anyway, so I went to St. Columbus, Shah Rukh Khan. He's much older than me, so don't you know, think I'm in the same batch as him. Uh, and then when I was 14, my family and I moved to Sydney, uh, where I did my last years of high school and my law school here. And in Australia, similar to India, it's five years and you combine law with something else. So art, science, finance. Um, so I chose finance. Uh, and then at the end of that five year journey, my first job or graduate job was with a law firm called Linklaters uh, in their London office, which is their headquarters. So I went to London, I did a couple of years with them there, uh, and then I moved with them to their Moscow office, Tokyo office, Singapore office. And then in Singapore, uh, I did about three years in their finance team. And then I moved into a US law firm called Mayor Brown, but still in their Singapore office, working on big projects like power projects, infrastructure, roads, uh, petrochemical plants. Uh, so that was quite fun. And then in the middle of 2019, so again, after about three years at Mayor Brown, I decided I want to become an in-house lawyer. 
And so in-house lawyers, for those of you who don't know, are essentially lawyers, but they don't work for law firms. They work at a company, within a company, uh, advising on legal issues that may come up. So, you know, Pepsi, Nestle, Unilever, Hindustan Lever, all of these companies have lawyers in their companies who, who advise. So uh, I moved into a company called Yum Brands, which uh, nobody has really heard of. And even I hadn't heard of it before I applied, but you will know their brands. Uh, they are KFC, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell. And uh, I think India is one of the lucky nations in the world that has all three brands uh, in there. So um, I, I was doing legal work for them for about three years. And then just in November last year, so just about four or five months ago, I decided to move back to Sydney to be close to my family. I think COVID has made us all realize that family and friends are the most important people in our lives. So that's what I'm doing now. And I'm working at a, at a bank right now as an in-house lawyer. But on the side, also, I run this platform called Law Ninjas, which I've been running again since about 2017. When I first moved in-house, I started it. And uh, the website is lawninjas.co, so C-O. And so do check it out. Um, we've got lots and lots of videos of workshops that we've done with leading senior lawyers around the world uh, on all kinds of topics that you're probably thinking of, such as you know studying law in the US, studying law in the UK, studying law in Singapore, uh, working as a lawyer at a law firm or at a in-house role in different industries and in different segments and sectors. Uh, in fact, every Thursday, so today, we run a free weekly workshop on different topics. And you guys are very lucky because just in about an hour or so, uh, we're running a workshop um, about law firms in India and careers at law firms in India. So I think all of you will really enjoy that one because it's got uh, lawyers from uh, Shardul Amarchal Mangaldas, Cyril Amarchal Mangaldas, and another law firm in Delhi as the panel, and I'm the moderator. And you can ask whatever questions you want, but the questions that definitely will be asked of the panelists are things like, how do I get an internship at your farm? Or what's it like to work at your farm? Or how did you get to where you are today? And so in the chat, I've just put in the link to the uh, webinar and it's free and it's pretty easy to kind of register and it's only for an hour, so it's pretty quick. Um, but anyway, that's Law Ninjas. So it's, that's quite fun and exciting uh, as well. Anyway, whilst you're all thinking of questions to ask, uh, let me sort of start off things by saying that I've done this kind of workshop or session for quite a few law schools in India and elsewhere. And the first question I always ask anyone is, I want you all to take a step back. And I want you to think about why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you a law student? Why did you become a law student? Is it because you wanted to defend the oppressed? Is it because your uncle is a lawyer? Is it because you wanted to make lots of money? Is it because you watched way too many episodes of Suits on Netflix? Whatever the reason is, and there's no right or wrong answer, but whatever the reason is, I think sometimes it's important to take a step back and just reflect on why we're doing what we're doing. Because unfortunately or fortunately, sometimes we lose track of uh, why the, the reasons and the rationale for some of our decisions as we're doing things. So, you know, during law school, during the five years, we kind of lose track or even during our careers, we lose track as to why we're doing it. So I want you all to take a step back. I want you to really think during the session, what is it that's driving you towards this legal career? Because there's a Japanese concept, and I'll put it in the chat again, called Ikigai. And Ikigai is essentially um, says that anything we do in our careers and our life should ideally tick four boxes, okay? So the first box is you need to ask yourself that this career that I'm planning to pursue, is it something that the world actually needs? Is there a need for it, right? The second question you need to ask yourself is, is it something that I can be paid for? Is it something that I can sustain myself on, pay my rent with, pay my Netflix account with? all of those things. The third question is, is it something that I'm actually good at? Is it something I have an aptitude for? And then the fourth and final question is, is it something that I have a passion for? I'm curious about, I want to learn more about, I'm excited about. So for example, uh, I'm going to pick on whoever's name I can see. Uh, Lippy, Lippy. 
So Lippy, if you don't mind unmuting your microphone and just letting me know what area of law you're most interested in. Uh, good evening. Can you hear Hi. me? Yes. Yeah. So, so basically, I am interested in criminal law. Excellent. So you can defend me when I get into trouble. Um, brilliant. So criminal law. Okay. So now, Lippy, let's say you and I, after this workshop, we were having a conversation and you said, you know, Rohan, I don't know what to do. I'm interested in criminal law, but you know, what should I do? So I'd say, okay, first question is, why do you want to do criminal law? Is it because, you know, you saw, again, too many TV shows, you've read too many John Grisham thrillers, or, you know, is there another reason? But once we figure that out, then I'll say, okay, let's go through that Ikigai framework and let's figure out those four questions. So I'll say, first thing is, is there a need for criminal lawyers in the world? I think that's an easy yes, because lots of criminals, lots of bad stuff going on, and they all need lawyers to defend themselves, uh, defend them. So that's the first question, so that's an easy yes. Second question is, is this something that you can be paid well for? Uh, depends, if you're a prosecution lawyer or a defense lawyer, uh, it also depends on whether you wanna do it in India or elsewhere, but yeah, typically if you reach a certain stage in your career, you can be paid pretty well, um, and uh, you know, you'll be able to sustain yourself. So that's not a problem. So that's a yes as well. Third question is, is this something that you're good at? And so that's where we'll kind of kind of delve slightly deeper into, you know, did you do the subject at law school? Uh, what kind of grade did you get? Uh, if uh, in addition to that, you know, we'll look at, you know, did you write any journal articles on it? Did you write a blog about it? You know, where is that aptitude? Are you good at this thing that you're trying to pursue in your career? And then the fourth and final question, probably the most important one is, is this something that you're really excited about, curious about, want to learn more about, do you read about it, do you, you know, get really passionate about it. If you said yes, 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 yes to me for all those four questions, then I would say fantastic. But then the next step is I want you to actually get some work experience in that space. So whether that's in an office environment or a law firm doing criminal law work or in a courthouse environment or working with a judge or working with a barrister or attorney or advocate who does criminal law work. Um, because working on a day-to-day -day basis on something uh, is very different act just you know reading about it in a textbook or attending a lecture about it. So I think that's super, super important. Uh, so that that's the kind of thinking I would go through. And for anyone who's kind of listening in, depend it doesn't matter what area of law you're interested in but we would go through the same sort of analysis and try and you know, really hone in on, on why you're doing what you're doing and how you can do it. Because when I went to Linklater's, um, I thought for sure that I wanted to be a corporate and mergers and acquisitions lawyer. I thought this is the thing, I'm gonna be famous, I'm gonna be in the newspapers, people are gonna be throwing money at me, it's gonna be amazing. Um, so I went to London and uh, in the UK, typically what they offer to junior lawyers or lawyers who've just graduated is something called a training contract. So it's two years and it's divided into four different departments or seats as they call them of six months each. So you get to do, you know, maybe like banking and litigation and something and something. So you get a taste of what it is and then you qualify or you sort of go into one of those departments as a proper associate lawyer is what they call it. So I thought, for sure, I wanted to corporate work, right? So I went there, I said, hey, I want to do corporate work. They said, well, it's September, 2008. And so I, I want, this is a bit of a quiz or a trivia question. Now in the chat, I want you to have a think and I want you to answer what happened in September, 2008. How old were you guys in September 2008? Um, so yeah, so it's September 2008. That is exactly Hishikesh. So that's when the global financial crisis happened, the GFC as the cool kids call it. Um, no relation to KFC. So literally the Monday, I think it was the 28th of September probably, I joined. So my first day I'm like, you know, I've done my hair. I had more hair back then. I done my hair, you know, I'm dressed in a suit. I looked like Harvey Specter from Suits. And I walk in and I'm like, yes, you know, my career is beginning. And literally on the Sunday, so the day before is when Lehman Brothers had just gone bust and everybody around the world was panicking and 
yeah. So anyway, so they put me in the banking department for six months because that's where they needed more lawyers. And so that was really interesting because, you know, I learned a lot about banking, which I didn't know anything about. And uh, it was a good experience and I had a good boss and all that. But then my next seat was going to be corporate and mergers and acquisitions. So I was like, yes, this is, this is what I asked for. Yeah, within the first two weeks of that six month uh, seat, I realized corporate is not what I wanted to do. Uh, personal preference, I'm not saying corporate is bad or corporate lawyers are bad. I know a lot of corporate lawyers who are very successful. But for me personally, I wanted to do something slightly more tangible. I wanted to do something where I could actually touch or see what I'd worked on or what I'd built, which is kind of what took me into this world of project finance. Like I told you, you know, about car projects and all of that. So anyway, so I did that. So the point behind that story was that, you know, Lippy or whoever else, you know, if you want to do something, then that work experience is super important because when you do that work, and you, and you live it day to day, you might realize, mm, I actually don't like this very much, or it's very different from what I thought it was going to be. Uh, because again, I'm not a criminal lawyer, but Libby, I've been to some of the courts uh, in Australia and in India, and I can assure you, if you haven't done it yet, I, I, I would highly recommend doing it because it's a different world. Yeah, The main thing which I realized when I went to a court in Gurgaon near Delhi was that uh, all the alleged criminals are there and the cops are all there but i didn't see any handcuffs they were all just holding hands with each other and i was like mm, this is not very safe but anyway so that, that's the kind of stuff that you need to kind of see for your own eyes and deal with with your own eyes so i think that's super important okay so that's that bit so i haven't seen any questions in the chat but i'm going to keep going so i think the next bit uh, i think that's going to be quite useful for all of you is maybe some tips and tricks on your two most important documents, uh, which are your CV or resume and your cover letter, okay? So now again, in the chat, and this is gonna be a slightly easier question, how many pages should your CV be? Put your answers in the chat. So we got one, two, two, less than three. Nobody's saying zero. That's always a good sign. One, two, three. Okay, three more seconds. Three, two, one. All right, time's up. Okay, so I think given that you're all in your sort of five-year journey at law school, at this stage of your journey, I would say aim for two pages, okay? Maximum of two pages, okay? Once you get out into the workforce, once you got a few deals and medals and cases under your belt, then maybe you can stretch it to three pages. But even then, I would say keep it at two pages if you can. Now, if you're all thinking, wait a second, my CV is 10 pages long. What do I do now? That's okay. Cut it down as much as you can. Okay. Nobody wants to read a whole you know, essay about you. The, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the person who's going to be reading it, right? It's not going to be some student somewhere. It's going to be a law firm partner. It's going to be the head of HR or some HR person at a law firm or at a company. And they don't have time. They're getting hundreds or thousands of CVs every month for roles that they're advertising. And so, yeah, if you can be short, succinct, punchy, concise with what you say, because those are all the skills that lawyers are meant to have, uh, I think that's going to go a long way. So aim for two pages, all right? And if uh, you can't fit it all in two pages, then, you know, increase the margins, decrease the font, do whatever you can. Microsoft Word is amazing that way. Um, that's the first thing. So that's length. But let's talk about the content. So what actually goes into your CV? Because that's super important as well, right? So the first section probably in your CV should be around yourself. So you. So you put your full name your email address, your phone number, so that people can reach out to you, they can contact you and get to know you and call you in for an interview, right? Okay, easy enough. Next section can be maybe around your education. So this is where you can kind of say 2000 to 2025 uh, LLB at XYZ University, Delhi, India, right? And then you put in maybe a line about if you got some grade or GPA, you put it in as well. And then you go back in time to any other courses or diplomas or degrees or high school uh, certificates that you have. Okay. Then the next section can be around your work experience. So one big call out I'd like to make 
around the work experience is, and I see this a little bit too often from India, Nigeria, Kenya, everywhere around the world, is people or students say, even lawyers actually, like who've been in the profession for a while say this, they say um, August 2020, September to September 2020, internship at Shardul Amartan Mangala's Delhi, India corporate team. And that's it. And then they go to the next line and they say December 2020, January 2021. Blah, blah, blah. Now, what's great about that previous sentence is that in one very concise line, you've told the reader where the internship was, what firm it was at, um, what the duration was, all of that. So you were you were concise, you were short, you were punchy, succinct, all those things that I asked you to do. But you haven't told the reader anything about what it is that you actually did during that one or two month internship. For all we know, you could have been sitting at your desk watching Korean dramas on your phone, right? So don't let anybody make assumptions about what you were doing or not doing during your work experience. I know, look, I think everybody knows that internships are not going to be as cool or sexy as you know they're made out to be on, on uh, television shows. We know that it's not going to be the most exciting work. You're not going to be arguing multi-million dollar lawsuits in court in your first month, right? But you can at least put in a couple of lines saying assisting the corporate team with drafting documents or reviewing briefs or editing memoranda, whatever it is, put in something so that people know, okay, these are the things he or she worked on. Okay. And then you go back in time and you put in any other sort of internships or work experience you have. Now, I can see lots of faces. There are 50 of us in the room, and I'm sure all of you are at different stages of your law degree. Some of you are in your first year, some of you are in your fifth year, and you've all kind of got different experiences and you're all going to different law schools as well, I guess. Now, if you're in your first or second year, my advice to you, and this is regardless of which country or which law schools you, uh, which country you come from, which law school you go to, is that don't put too much pressure on yourself. Take this time to learn about your surroundings. What is the law? What is this thing called the law? Um, you know, absorb as much as you can, meet people. Unfortunately, now you have to do it a bit more virtually, but nevertheless, meet people. Uh, you know, go to workshops like this one, go to the Law Ninjas workshops. You know, just see what else is out there in the profession. Because, you know, you might come into the legal profession thinking, I want to be a criminal lawyer because that's what all the movies and TVs glamorize. But then you might realize that either you don't want to do it or you found something more interesting. You could find environmental law really interesting or you could find uh, employment law really interesting, which, you know, has to do with, you know, harassment and all these things that everybody has to deal with, uh, you know, in an office environment. And, you know, if you've been fired uh, unjustly and all these things. So. You, know, you just never know. So point is just get out there, learn as much as you can. Don't put too much pressure on yourself to, oh, I must get an internship because my fourth friend in fourth year, he's already got two internships. Relax, okay? Take it easy. Enjoy your time as well. You're not going to get this time back in your life. My, the, my favorite year of my life was my first year of university because that's such a good time, okay? And I studied hard as well. And you Because you're making friends and these friends will stick with you and be your friends for maybe most of your life, okay? So absorb as much as you can. If you're in your fourth or fifth year, then yes, I can understand. You got a little bit of pressure. You got a little bit of, you know, internships and things to worry about. Um, you know, I get students sometimes saying to me, I'm in my fourth or fifth year and I don't have any internships. What should I do? I say, okay, well, whatever time you have left at law school, try and get something, try and, you know, uh, build your CV, make it as robust a document as possible. But Nevertheless, even if you don't have any internships, then you should be able to justify why you don't have any internships. Is it because you volunteered at a charity somewhere? Or is it because you were playing sport? Or is it because you were learning a language? Whatever it is, you need to be able to justify yourself. Because otherwise, again, we'll just think you were sitting on your couch eating popcorn the entire day. So you just got to be able to justify every single sentence and line in your CV in the best way possible. Okay. Then the next section can be around whatever extracurricular, co-curricular achievements you have. So anything other than working and studying. So this is where, you know, if you, again, like I said, volunteer experience, if you've done any mooting or debating or mock trials, if you've done any journal write, article writing, all that stuff, and you can kind of put it under separate sub subheadings to make it slightly prettier, okay? 
Then the final two sections, and these are the two sections that the people don't pay enough attention to when they're drafting their CV, but I can assure you that people are paying attention to it when they look at your CV. The first one is around your hobbies and interests. Now, I've had students in the past say to me that Rowan, we were talking to a law firm the other day uh, and that law firm said, and this is in India, that law firm said that, oh, we don't wanna know what your uh, hobbies and interests are. Don't waste time on that in your CV. Make sure your CV has your work experience, your education, your grades, uh, and that's all we're gonna focus on. Now, my view on this is slightly controversial, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, I strongly believe that if any company or law firm doesn't want to know what your hobbies and interests are or what interests you outside of working and studying, that law firm or company is not worth working for. They should be interested in who you are as a person. They should be interested in what you like to do, whether it's music or sport or arts. They should want to know you as a person. You're not a robot. Nobody's a robot. Okay. Even that person who's reading your CV has hobbies and interests. So don't hide who you are in your CV. Be honest, be transparent, um, and uh, you know, just really put your story and your personality out there. Because, and I'll tell you a story. So I have a friend here in Sydney, uh, and he's Indian originally, and he loves cricket like a lot of us do. And so in his CV, in his hobbies and interests section, he put down a line saying, "I." I'm passionate about cricket and I play for my local cricket team. Nothing super advanced or senior, but he plays for his local suburban cricket team and uh, he put it in. He then sent his CV out to about 20 law firms in Australia and he went in for interviews. And one of the interviews, there was a very senior, scary looking elderly partner at this firm who, you know, he walks in, shakes hands, uh, sits down, they do their hellos. And then the partner has my friend's two page CV in his left hand and he, flips over the first page. So all that stuff I just talked about, about your education, work experience, everything, he just flips over, skips it. He goes straight to the hobbies and interests section. He goes straight to the line about cricket and he looks at my friend and he's like, do you like cricket, do you? My friend's suddenly panicking in his mind. He's like, oh my God, what have I done? Is this guy gonna yell at me if I said something wrong? But then my friend did something which I think all of us should do and all of you should do whenever you're in a situation which is difficult, you should be honest. Be open, be transparent. What do you have to hide? Don't be afraid of these things. So he said, yes, uh, I, I like cricket. The partner put the CV down and for the next hour of that interview, they talked about Sachin, they talked about the IPL, they talked about the World Cup. And I can assure you that that, that interview went very well. My friend got the job offer at the end of that and he had a very good couple of years at law firm. So the moral of that story is that you just don't know who's gonna be reading your CV or cover letter at the end of the line. So don't hide who you are, don't be afraid, okay? Then the last section is around your referees or references. Now there's two ways that you can do this. The first way is kind of the old school traditional way, way where you kind of put in two names of referees of people you've worked with or your professors at law school who know you or who you know, marked your exams and uh, you put in their contact details and then that's it, right? Now, I'm gonna tell you why that approach is slightly risky and slightly outdated. So Sandeep, right? Let's say you put Ayush and Rachna as your two referees in your CV and you send that out to law firms across India. The next day, Ayush calls you and says, hey Sandeep, how's it going? Uh, I just wanted to let you know that I've changed my mind. I actually don't wanna be a referee anymore. I don't think you're a very good lawyer. So uh, goodbye. So Sandeep, you're in a bit of trouble now because your CV's out there and Ayush's details are there and somebody could call him and say, hey, what do you think of Sandeep? And Ayush may or may not say very nice things about you. So let's not even let that risk even come up or that situation you know, become a possibility. So let's follow the second approach, which is the one I would recommend, which is using three magic words, which are available on request. Okay. Now what available on request does is it gives you two things. It gives you time and it gives you flexibility. Okay. I'll tell you what that means. So in reality, when you're sending a CVR for jobs, right? They're not going to open your CV on their computers or in the mail and immediately call up your referee and say, Hey, what do you think of Sandeep? 
that's not how it works. How it works is they look at your CV, they'll figure out if you fit the job description, you know, if you've got the right grades and the experience and the extracurriculars and the hobbies and interests. And then maybe they might call you in for an interview or they'll speak to you on the phone or they'll do something over Zoom or Microsoft Teams. And then as a next step, they may, you know, make you meet somebody else in the law firm. And then as a final step or somewhere near the end, they'll say, okay, let's check out Sandeep's referees just to make sure he didn't do anything too crazy at his previous law firm. So it gives you a bit of time, it gives you a bit of time to figure out who you want to put in as your referee, because you, you never know, right? During your interview or during that whole process, you might hear something that they ask you or they say that triggers something in your mind. You're like, oh, wait a second. They wanted to know more about that. So maybe I should put my professor from law school as my referee rather than my boss as my referee. You know what I mean? Like you, you'll get that time to figure it out. That's the first thing. The second thing is it'll give you flexibility. So once, I mean, right now you don't have, you know, graduate work experience and that's fine. Uh, you've got a few internships maybe under your belt. Or you've got, done a few, you know, courses where you have professors or teachers who can vouch for you. But once you're out into the workforce, then, you know, you start to develop more relationships, more contacts, and you might have more than two referees to choose from. You might have four or six referees. So for example, for me, I have a list of about five or six people I've worked with. And so what I do is if I'm, let's say, applying for a banking law position, I look at my list. I'm like, oh, yeah, these are the two people I did banking law work with. So I'll put them into my application for this job. Or if I'm applying to the international human rights organization, then I look at the two people I did international law work with and I put them into my application. So again, it gives you a bit of flexibility. Okay, that's your CV, done. So before I move on to the cover letter, let's answer some of the questions in the chat. So uh, I'm just gonna go randomly. Is there any way to work for the ICC or the ICJ? So ICC is the International Criminal Court and the ICJ is the International Court of Justice. So my advice, and I, I haven't worked for the ICC or ICJ. I have been to the ICJ in The Hague in the Netherlands. And it's a beautiful building, by the way. So if any of you, once travel resumes, if any of you get the opportunity to do it, um, go visit it. It's really cool to see as a lawyer of the law school. Um, I think, and this is not just ICJ, ICC, it's also just UN or anything else, even partnered law firm, like whatever you're aspiring to do. I think one piece of advice I would give you is two words, look up, okay? So what lookup means is two things. It means first thing is look at the people who are doing what you want to do. Okay. So, and a great way to do this is obviously Googling the person or looking on LinkedIn. So what you can do uh, is you can look at who are the judges at the ICC or who are the prosecutors at the ICJ, type their names in or type that kind of job title in, and then you'll get all the profiles, you know? let's say five or 10 of them, and then look at their profile. So you'll see that, you know, first thing you'll notice is that they've all done different things, okay? There's no set formula or magic recipe to getting to the ICC or ICJ or whatever it is that you're aiming for. Um, but you'll start to see patterns. So you'll start to see, okay, they did a master's of law or they did a PhD or they know more than one language or they got overseas work experience or they went somewhere to work whatever it is, you'll get to see. And so those are the things that will give you ideas as to how you need to get to where you want to go at the end of the day, okay? So is there any way to work for the ICC, ICJ? Yes, there is. It just, you need to look at the profiles of the people who've done it and you need to figure that out. But that's given me a great idea that I will run a Law Ninjas workshop on that topic about international organizations. I'm actually, I actually just emailed a guy today who's from India but he works at the World Bank, which is another international organization in Washington, DC. So I'll get him to speak and hopefully my other two speakers will be from some similar ICC type organization. So yeah, that'll hopefully be helpful. But looking up is super important. So that's the first bit is looking at the profiles of people who've done or are doing what you want to do. The second part to looking up is actually speaking to the people who are doing what you want to do. That's obviously slightly trickier because you know you got to actually like message them or call them somehow. But you can reach out to people on LinkedIn. And so one thing I would say is if you do reach out to somebody, whether it's through email or LinkedIn or messaging or whatever, don't do what a lot of students around the world do, which is they go in straight for the sales pitch. 
They send, they attach their CV to the message and they say, hi, my name is Rohan and I want to work for the ICC one day and please look at my CV and give me a job. That never works, okay? And it's actually going to turn the person off you. They're not going to even look at your CV. They're not even going to look at your message and they probably won't even reply. So don't do that. How I would suggest you do it is you can send them a message and you say, uh, hi, Richard, uh, I have taken a look at your profile and I see that you've had a really interesting career where you're now working at the ICJ as a prosecutor. I'm currently a student in India and I'm really interested in international law. If possible, would you have 15 minutes next week where we can have a quick Zoom call and you can tell me a little bit about how I can pursue this career? Something like that, okay? You have to be polite, you have to be respectful, you have to be short, punchy again. And look, what's, what's the worst that could happen, right? They either won't reply, which does happen a lot, okay? Because people are busy and sometimes people don't check their LinkedIn messages. Second thing is they might just reply and say no, which is slightly evil and mean, and I don't think that will happen. Or the third thing is they might say yes. Can you imagine if that person said yes? You've got this kind of amazing 15 minutes to look forward to. And from their perspective, right? Look, a lot of lawyers, a lot of judges, a lot of senior people out there in the profession, not just in the legal world, but elsewhere in business and arts and everything, they want to help. They want to mentor and coach young students and young minds either they don't have the time to do it or they are they're not going to take the first step right they're not going to message you and say i want to mentor you you have to take the first step and so you have to kind of um you know just see it from their perspective that they want to do this but they just don't have a platform to do it or they just don't know how to do it so if you reach out to them they may actually value that you put in some time and effort you've got some courage uh and so that can put you in good stand from their perspective again they're not spending any money right it's a virtual chat so they don't have to go anywhere or do anything. They can do it in their pajamas if they want to. So it's quite easy and straightforward as well. Okay, look, look up. Indeed, sir. And LinkedIn, um, by the way, is a fantastic tool. Sorry. Uh, uh, indeed, sir. Uh, I have a very interesting question in the chat box, which asks you, like, how can a law graduate uh, apply or like work in UK specifically if they are from India? Are there any uh, career trajectories or any tips? Yeah, thank you. Um, so there's a few ways you can do it. Okay, so a lot of Indian lawyers from NLUs and non NLUs do go to the UK for work experience. So I would link later, for example, which is called a magic circle firm, which is essentially one of the top five UK firms this is kind of how the magic circle is defined. Um, a lot of Indian lawyers there. Um, yes, they come from the NLUs typically, but that's not a prerequisite, I don't think, for a lot of UK law firms. And you just need to make sure that your grades are decent, that your CV is decent, your couple letters decent, and then you got to also make sure that you know during the interview process you you show commercial awareness, you show that you know you have a passion or some sort of enthusiasm for the work, and that you're not just kind of there to put it on your CV and do a nice two-year training contract and then go back and do something else. So you got to show, you know, all of these things. So I guess the question, if I had to answer it, I'm going to look at it in the chat. Can you tell me more about them? Yeah. So there's a few ways, right? You can either go to an LLM in the UK. So you can go do a master's in the UK. And then during that LLM or after that LLM, you can sort of get into a UK law firm and say, give me an internship or give me a training contract. So that's one way you can do it. The other way you can do it is a lot of these law firms, like I know Linklater does it and a few of the others do it as well. If you look at their websites, they offer what they call a vacation scheme. I don't know why British law firms call internships vacation schemes. It's not a vacation, but that's what it's called. Uh, and usually it's for four weeks uh, in their London office and uh, there's an application process and there's a certain deadline that you have to you know, comply with. So you got to look at the websites, you got to figure out you know, what the deadlines are and what the requirements are and um, you got to do it that way. The other thing you could do is work for a little while in an Indian law firm, you know, build a foundation, figure out what it is that you want to do. Is it corporate? Is it banking? Is it litigation? Whatever it is. And then what will happen when you're working at an Indian law firm, regardless of whether it's a SAM or a CAM or something else, is that you'll meet and work with other people who may have worked in the UK or 
done some time in Singapore, or Dubai, or Hong Kong, or Bangkok, or the US, and you will learn from them, and you will also be able to ask them how they did it. And they may come from your law school, or they may come from a similar, you know, journey as you have. And so that'll give you a good idea. And also, I think once you've done that, you'll then be in a better position to say to a law, law firm in the UK or in Singapore and Dubai that, hey, guys, I've got two years of work experience at an Indian law firm in corporate. I would like to work for you. And then, you know, you can kind of do it that way. So there's a few ways you can do it. There's no set formula. But I would say so, you know, that that's quite important. Um, so the, the workshop I did about um, studying in the UK, I think that'll be very useful for you, Herman. So um, yeah, we can connect after this about that. Uh, I want to become an international law academician. I can't even say that word. Uh, will your webinar focus on that area? So I haven't done any um, academia type workshops so far, but I do, I'm planning to do it. I actually run a, another group, part of London ninjas called law professor ninjas which has professors from around uh, the world including i think from some of your law schools and so yeah i might get them to speak about what it's like to be a law professor uh, just a, just a uh, request sir about the workshop that you're talking about it would mm -hmm. be great if you could share it with us or maybe in the chat box wherever so that students can access the same so so what i would suggest everyone to do is that firstly if you don't have a linkedin account today that's okay but I want you to open an account by Sunday, okay? That's the deadline I'm giving you. And when you've opened the LinkedIn account, obviously follow Memo Pundits and follow Law Ninjas and add me. I'm the only Rohan Billimore in the world, so I'm pretty easy to find and message me. But if you follow me, then you'll get to see all the workshops that are coming up. But in any event, I put the link to tonight's workshop in the chat and I'm putting it again in the chat. So if you register for this one, you'll then get added to the distribution list and you'll get to sort of see all the future webinars. The one next Thursday is about lawyers in intellectual property. So if you guys are interested in IP, that's gonna be a great one. And we've got two speakers from India and one speaker from Singapore who's worked at some big firms. And so that might be quite useful. Anyway, so that's, that's how you kind of uh, get in the loop and, and keep up to date what's happening. Um, Indeed, sir. I just had a follow-up question with respect sure. to your earlier answer. I had researched for a vacation scheme for a US firm, uh, namely HSF. So I think that they have a policy that uh, uh, only maybe the people from US can apply. So I just wanted to inquire if that's a policy for UK firms as well, or is it different? Yeah. So HSF, which is Herbert Smith Freehills, that's actually a UK firm. So Freehills is an Australian firm and Herbert Smith is a UK firm and they merged a few years ago and now they're called HSF. Um, yeah, so I um, think HSF does, ex yeah, HSF for sure accepts Indian law students for his vacation schemes and training contracts. You just have to look at their website and you have to kind of figure that out. American firms in New York, they don't have the same kind of Indian vacation scheme system. Cause I think, yeah, in the US they typically uh, prefer to hire locals there's so many lawyers already in the US. Uh, but in the UK, I think they're a bit more open to taking others from the Commonwealth. So, you know, I've worked with Nigerian lawyers in the UK. I've worked with Kenyan lawyers, you know, all these Commonwealth countries. Um, so, so that's what I would say is, is you've got to look at the websites and you've got to sort of, you know, follow closely because, and you don't have to go for the big names. You don't have to go for the Linklaters or the Clifford Chance or those guys. You can go for, you know, sort of, smaller or more medium-sized firms as well and they they do hire so again yeah don't close your options and the other thing is you don't have to go to the uk or you don't have to go to new york uh you know like i said i've done nine years in singapore and there were so many indian lawyers in singapore in fact uh cyril lamanchan mangaldas i think just last week they opened an office in singapore nishit desai has had an office in singapore for quite a while now all these indian firms are opening up in these kind of jurisdictions because they know that clients want Indian law advice or want to, they want to invest into India, but they want their lawyer where they are rather than in India. And so, you know, you'll get opportunities that way. I know a student uh, from a very small law school in the south of India, not an NLU or anything. And she's now working at a big uh, company in Bangkok as a lawyer. You know what I mean? Like there's all, all these opportunities out there that you never even hear of or think about, and but they are there. So you don't have to go for a law firm in the UK, 
uh, you can go for a law firm in India and then move and then figure out what it is that you want to do. Um, so don't, yeah, don't restrict yourself in that way. Uh, so Muskan Indeed, said, sir, thank you for clarifying. No worries. Uh, Muskan said, I'm in my second year. I've done an internship with an NGO and an online internship with a law firm. Now, where should I do my internship? I'm also interested in arbitration. Ooh, Muskan. So just a couple of weeks ago, we had a session on arbitration where we had uh, Chahat, who's uh, from, I uh, can't remember which city in India, but he uh, works at SIAC, which is the Singapore International Arbitration Center, which is awesome to work for. And we also had Manish, who went to Nalsar, and he's now in the UK as a partner at a big arbitration law firm. And then we had a lady from Egypt who does arbitration. So that, I think, will answer a lot of your questions. Uh, what, what I was going to say was, I think internships, you're in your second year, Muskan. So you've done NGO, you've done online, you're doing well, OK? So again, don't kill yourself. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. But I would say just keep your options open, keep learning. You know, now you've done online, you know, do something else, maybe corporate, do a bit of banking, like, you know, just figure out what it is that you're interested in. Uh, and then, and then you'll kind of go at arbitration. I think uh, you'll hear that workshop that uh, a lot of them think that an LLM can be quite helpful if you want to do arbitration, uh, because it's quite an academic type of subject and arbitration. One of the good things is that it's very universal, right? It doesn't matter whether you come from uh, Africa or Asia or Australia, arbitration, the rules are quite you know, common across jurisdictions. So it doesn't matter if you come from a civil law or common law background. So that's quite, quite cool. Um, so hopefully Muskan, that workshop will be helpful for you. Um, and then Muskan also said, we study Indian law. So how can we get jobs in foreign countries? Laws we study in the law of the country. Yeah. So I worked in Moscow. I don't know a thing about Russian law. I worked in Japan. I don't know a thing about Japanese law. So the way you can do it is you work like at an Indian law firm and or you work at a UK law firm because UK laws, Indian laws, they're not super different. Uh, and a lot of like um, banking lawyers, a lot of corporate, I think a lot of banking lawyers, for example, a lot of what we do, because I'm a banking lawyer right now, it's not very legal. It's not very law. It's all about contracts. It's all about drafting. It's all about negotiating. I mean, very rarely do you have to, have to figure out what this legal word means or what that case said. Uh, so, you know, you can kind of uh, move into a UK environment quite well in that space, I think. And then hopefully that firm that you work for, that company you work for will have offices in other places and that's how you move. So for example, I know an Indian lawyer who works at, again, coincidentally, a company who has an office in Bangkok, but he didn't go straight to Bangkok. He worked for them in Delhi first in, in their Gurgaon office. And then he moved within, because he said, I want to go overseas. And then, you know, these big companies like the Pepsi's and the Coca-Cola's and these guys, they all say, okay, fine. We'll give you a two year contract in our Dubai office. You go. And then if you do a good job, we'll move you somewhere else or you have to come back. You know what I mean? So there are all these opportunities out there that, uh, again, you don't think of. Um, there are two, ch I usually said, there are two chances that back schemes that come away and it's intense. How do I know these two chances won't be my last chance? And what do I do to make sure that I'm able to? So I'm not sure what you mean by two chances, Ayush. Um, but in any event, look, even if you get rejected from something, it's not the end of the world. You don't have to kind of say, oh my God, I'm never going to get anything ever. Uh, I actually got, I applied for, a, was it an internship? Yeah, I applied for an internship, I think, at Herbert Smith Freehill, so HSF. And they rejected me. Yeah, I still hate them for that. No, it's a very good firm. Um, but you know, you you're going to face these things. And actually, I know we have like nine minutes left, but let me um, sort of tell you guys a little bit of a story, which will hopefully answer actually quite a lot of your questions and also answer Ayush's question. So when I was in my fourth year of law school in Australia, and if you guys remember, it's five years here, so I was in my second last the penultimate year, and all my friends were applying for law firm jobs in Australia, okay? I looked at that option, I thought about it, I spoke to people and I realized very, very quickly, that's not what I wanted to do, okay? I wanted to go overseas like a lot of you do. I wanted to step outside my comfort zone. I wanted to challenge myself. But I had zero idea about how to do that because nobody had given me a workshop about it and nobody had told me what to do. So I did something slightly crazy. I took a sip for suspense. Um, 
I took out my laptop on a Sunday afternoon and I wrote an email. Okay, the email said, Dear sir, my name is Rowan Billimoria and I would like to apply for an internship at your law firm this summer. My CV is attached. Kind regards, Rowan. Worst cover email in the world. Please never write a cover email like that in your life. But I wrote it because nobody told me how to write a cover email. Uh, and I sent that to, and I'm not joking when I say this, I sent that to 100 law firms around the world. When I say around the world, I mean, literally, I looked at the globe and I just picked every city I could think of, like Istanbul, New York, London, Bangkok, da, da, da. Okay, so now in the chat, I want you all to answer this question for me. Out of those 100 emails that I sent, how many yes responses, how many yes responses did I get? Twenty to thirty. Madhuja says ten, and she apologizes. Thank you, Madhuja. Five. People are sending me direct messages just because they're embarrassed about saying such low numbers. Twenty-five. Two. Varsha, I'm not buying you lunch when I come to India. Twenty thirty minus ten. Thanks, Vivek. Ten thirty. All right. Three more seconds. Three, two, one. All right, okay, Devanshu has sent me a direct message saying 590. I think Devanshu, um, stick to law, maths is not your strong point. Um, no, so the correct answer, ladies and gentlemen, is a big fat zero. So I was rejected a hundred times. And I can assure you that I have a very big ego, just like most lawyers, and uh, my ego couldn't take it. But then, there was one email where the HR person at the law firm said, dear one, thank you for your email. We've taken a look at your CV and we see that you've got some paralegal experience in the litigation department of a law firm in Sydney. We unfortunately do not have a litigation department in our law firm here. So you might wanna apply elsewhere. Okay? They were very nice about it. Now, all of us, we've faced emails like that where they kind of tell us to go, you know, go somewhere else. We have three options in front of us. You can either do nothing, right? You can just not reply because what's the point, right? They've told us to go somewhere else. Why would we even reply? It's a waste of our time. Let's move on with our lives. Let's dust it off. Let's keep going. That's the first option. Second option is you reply and you send a very polite response saying, thank you so much for considering my application. I agree with your uh, suggestion, kind regards. Okay, that's the second option. The third option, and this is, I think, the one that everyone should adopt and the one I adopted, which is, you fight for what you want. Okay. So I replied to that lady and I said, thank you so much for considering my application. I agree that I only have litigation experience at this stage. However, my interest, my passion lies in corporate and mergers and acquisitions. And I firmly believe that an internship at your law firm will be not just a small step, but a giant leap towards achieving my vision of being a corporate lawyer one day. Okay, I threw in some man on the moon, Neil Armstrong language in there to jazz it up. Okay, two days later, I get a reply from that HR person saying, Rowan, thank you for your email. We would like to offer you a four week internship at a law firm. Uh, you'll have to pay for your own flights. You'll have to pay for your own accommodation. We'll pay you a very basic salary. Take it or leave it. I said, I'll take it. And so that firm turned out to be somebody called Linklaters and it was their office in Singapore. And so I flew from Sydney to Singapore on a budget airline because I couldn't afford anything else. I stayed at the YMCA in Singapore, which I can assure you is not the Grand Hyatt. And I worked very, very hard for four weeks. Okay. And as a result of that hard work, I got my opportunities at Linklater's and all those other places I mentioned earlier. So there are two morals to that story. Okay. The first moral, and to close things out, the first moral is that you, me, everybody else in the world, we're going to be rejected by everyone. Okay. It's going to happen over text. It's going to happen on WhatsApp. It's going to happen on conversation. Uh, rejection is kind of like taxes. Uh, it's inevitable. Okay. So yeah, it's going to happen. People are going to say no to you. It's going to happen in your professional life. It's also going to happen in your personal life. Okay. But do not let any other person dictate how you should lead your life or how you should craft your career. 
if you've done the homework, if you've figured out what it is that drives you, why you wanted to become a law student in the first place, you've done your Ikigai framework, and you know that this is the thing that you want to do, then you put all your time, energy, effort into making it happen. Okay. If we had more time, I could tell you about 16 stories about how I've been rejected from things. And now 17, including the Herbert Smith Freehill story, which I've forgotten about. I kind of put it to the back of my mind. Um, and something else better came along. Okay. So don't stress about it if you, somebody says no to you. Okay? If somebody says no to you, it's actually a reflection of their limitations, not yours. Okay, So you keep pushing forward. That's the first moral of that story. The second moral of that story is that one email, one conversation you have, one workshop you attend like this one can change your life forever. Okay. Now, look at me, right? If I hadn't sent that one email to that particular email address in Singapore on that day to that person, I would have been rejected by 99 law firms around the world. And I probably would have said to myself, clearly, I'm not a very good lawyer because everybody doesn't want to hire me. So I'll just settle. I'll just apply for a job here in Australia. I'll do what everybody else is doing. I'll follow the crowd. And I can assure you, if I had done that, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I definitely wouldn't be talking to you all today. Okay. So take a chance, roll the dice, never think twice about it. Life's short, so don't have to fear anything. Uh, as my mom says, you know, you just got to keep pushing, keep uh, believing in yourself uh, and things will happen for you. Okay. So yes.